Good afternoon. Uh, I'll try again. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Meyer, and I just want to make a couple of quick opening remarks by way of thanks. So I want to say thank you to the writers for being here. And I hope that um, in, in these couple of quick opening remarks that maybe you figure out something that you may not have known that might actually make this week even more meaningful. So I want to start by telling a very, 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 very quick story. But before I do that, I also want to thank the teachers. Um, and that's going to be part of the story that I'm going to tell, so I'll use their names in a few minutes. And I also want to thank people who are either here or not here who made this possible as well. So if somebody is here on your behalf, or somebody who isn't here who helped get you here, either think of them or look at them if they're here behind you. And take a minute just to, to give thanks for them too. So here's the quick story. You guys know the teacher Val, yes. Um, here's the story about Val, and I don't know if she told you the story. She might have told you, but maybe she didn't tell everybody in the room. So um, last December, early in December, in this very room, if you can believe it, there wasn't room for, there wasn't enough room, which is a good problem. We had a program that day the Hudson Valley Writing Project called Allies and Advocates. And anyone could come. It was a Saturday morning. The only thing was they have to give up Saturday morning. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to get up on a Saturday morning and come. But there was no room in the room. In fact, there were people in the hall, which is interesting. Why on earth would people be so interested in Allies and Advocates at this moment or at that moment? Well, maybe we hit something. Maybe we hit something that people are interested in, this notion of allies and advocates. And in these three, in three chairs in the front, there was a, a person named Laura, and I think some of you met Laura this week, who thinks of herself, and she is, a dreamer. She doesn't know how long she'll be in the United States, and yet she continues to advocate for other students and for educators to learn about the needs of undocumented youth and their families. And next to her was someone named Mary, and Mary's been working um, on behalf of migrant families um, because the kids of, uh, of, of migrant workers need education, and for the last 20 or 30 years, she's been an advocate, helping bring education to, to kids who otherwise wouldn't have it, and yet they have a right to it. And next to Mary was David. And David uh, does this whole, his, his region, and I don't know if this will sound small or large, but his region is not New Paltz, not Ulster County, not Ulster and Duchess, but it basically stretches from New York up to Albany. And his, his job is basically to support schools in meeting the needs of every child, in particular kids who are bilingual. And making sure not only that they're, the schools are delivering what they owe kids by law, but that they're doing it well. And he talked about that. And then afterwards, we had workshops with teachers like Val, teaching teachers about things that they've done in their classrooms to support second language learners, kids who are learning English as a second language. So why am I telling that story? Well, the quick reason I'm telling it is because you can hear a pin drop in this room. It was pretty exciting. And afterwards, on our way to the workshops, we're all kind of heading up the stairs and getting ourselves to the next place. Val comes up to me and says, I think we, we need to do something with the writing project with, I don't know what. I don't know if I have the words for it right this minute, but we need to do something. Because in the front of the room should be kids, too, because that's part of what the writing project's about. All of us are writers. It doesn't matter what age you are. And all of us can be advocates as part of a democracy, no matter what age, whether you vote or you don't vote. If you want to play in this game, you have to have a voice and you have to know what you think. And, and there's different ways to use writing to express that. And so I think over time, um, I said, you know, I've heard about this Maya Gold Foundation in New Paltz, Val. And she goes, I taught Maya Gold. 
And we thought, what if we wrote a grant to try to explain what it was we thought we were thinking about that day? Because we didn't quite have language for it yet. And generously, the Maya Gold Foundation did support this program because they said, yeah, this sort of fits the legacy of, of Maya, and so you're going to get a chance to uh, meet Maya's mom. Um, so that's the quick story. But then there's a teeny bit more story, so I just have to, I'm sorry to, to belabor my story. But the quick other bit of the story is another teacher at another time with the writing project said, and this was about three years ago, shouldn't the writing project be doing things to support the newest teachers? How do we support the newest teachers in the field so that they can really get a strong start in their career? How do we make a better place for them in the writing project? So Julia just completed our first ever program for teachers in the first three years of their career, just in May, I guess. And part of her opportunity in completing that program was then to team with a veteran teacher in the writing project, Val. And so this is really exciting for me because Julia also contributed to the vision of what this was because we think new teachers aren't, should just be learning from mentors but contributing to what we do and to offer your voice in what should happen in education. And then, I told you there's another person here, Lindsay, is a future teacher. And part of what we do in the writing project is we want future teachers to work with excellent teachers to get a vision of what, what could happen when you work with great kids who want to learn. What can we learn from them and how can we learn, uh, how can we kind of be part of that process? Because a lot of times future teachers are kind of put in the corner of a room just to kind of listen. And you don't get access to the conversation solely by, by listening in the corner of a live classroom. You need to be part of the conversation before, during, and after teaching. And you get to meet, you get to meet real kids by sitting next to them, hearing their work, reading their work. To, to, did any of you meet Lindsay this week? Of course, I, I guess, right? <laughs> and so thank you, Lindsay, for being part of our program, too. And the last thing I'll just say, um, and this is a, I think there's two last things. One is, I'm really excited for the work, so I, I want to get out of the way of that. Um, and I want to ask all of you, this week you should get something by email from us, from the Writing Project, saying, how did the program go from your point of view? What can we do better? We're always iterating, which is a fancy way of saying experimenting and trying to make our experiments stronger by input. So you all were asked to write a little bit about what it was like. Teachers will do that. We ask you all to do that as well. And then we, we learn from you. So thank you for responding to the survey. Um, if you haven't liked us, if you don't do Facebook, then don't do this. But if you do do Facebook, you can like the Writing Project and Facebook is a way to keep up. Or you can be on our mailing list, which would be fantastic. And now, Elise, I know you'd like, this would be great to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, it is really an honor to be here. Uh, as Tom mentioned, my, uh, Matthew, my husband, and I founded my Gold Foundation. It was, came as an aftermath of Maya, our daughter, 15, to provide tragically on October 2nd, 2015, and we needed to do something. So we're, we're doing a lot, but part of what we're doing is we founded the Maya Gold Foundation, and um, the mission of the foundation is to empower youth to access their inner wisdom and realize their dreams. And for me to just sit here and listen to Tom and look at that first line of part of the description of Rise Up and Write. This is a time for teens to advocate for a more just world. It is a perfect fit with empowering your inner wisdom and realizing your dreams. So I really want to say thank you for your important work. Um, the foundation, I left, I'm leaving some literature um, on the table if you want to pick it up after. We have a little wrap card we do. A lot of work here in New Falls and the Hudson Valley region. One piece of the work is because we volunteers, we, the board of directors and other support that can't attain the vision, the mission on our own, we raise money and offer grants to projects like this. And for this, it was almost a no-brainer when we received this application. It, on the committee, it was all yes, yes, yes. This is. 
beautiful. So I, I'm really eager to hear the outcome of it. We also do some other things. You might be aware of community series that we host. Um, those are different events in which presentations happen and adults and teens can learn together. And um, we also, in, as part of Maya's vision, and I won't take too much time, but she was really um, moved by trafficking and she wanted to do something about it in Nepal. Uh, she, she intended to graduate and go to high school and go to Nepal to help reduce trafficking. So she never made it, but we, the foundation, is leading trips in her name. So we led our first trip with 15 teens, 11 of them from New Pulse High School and others from surrounding areas. The first trip was in the spring of 2018. It was phenomenal, and uh, we're going to be leading another one this coming spring 2019. So applications are going to be online as of August 1st, but there's a little flyer about that. Just continue doing the wonderful work that you're doing. I am honored to be connected to it. And on the behalf of the board of the Michael Foundation, I give you my heartfelt appreciation. Thank you. I've always labeled a, a true act of bravery, and it really aligns to the mission of this week that, you know, to advocate, you have to be brave, and you have to raise your voice, and these writers have been doing that all week. Um, I'm going to tell just the, the, from my point of view to Tom's story, I was sitting on top of the table right there at that meeting in December because it was so packed. And just immediately, the writing project and then a lot of those anonymous extraordinaries, we, t we use that phrase this week, anonymous extraordinaries, that a lot of people help get stuff done that aren't standing behind the podium and that don't have a microphone but are working really hard behind the scenes to get it done. And so a lot of people jumped in to help, some of which you saw and heard about, and some of which you didn't. These guys are no longer the anonymous extraordinaries. They're just the extraordinaries, because they're going to be presenting their work. And I hope that it was a good week for you. And I hope that presenting your work is, is one of the first steps into continually presenting and putting the voice out there. So, without further ado, our first reading is a minute. trips, uterus placed on sale. For years, when the skirts were sewn tight and the shoes tighter, a chance for flight, but never to fight. So she starved herself until she could fly, consuming only the clouds, watching the world through her photoshopped eyes as dolls walk on runways with bodies for a contract. She has seen the tears wash away the red of a coat hanger death with the mother being lost instead because doctors were forced to step away as he stepped across her skin, leaving free, labeling the back of her neck. She has felt the burns left by stairs tracing her silhouette. There is no silence in his eyes. 
Across the world, there are girls. Across the world, there are girls, too afraid to call their families home, begging their fathers and brothers to believe the blood that they see is only from a paper cut. With birthday parties being arranged as weddings, for your sweet 16, you get a husband, my dear. There are mothers in jail, bellies behind bars, wondering if they will ever get to lay eyes on their child outside of their own skin. There are women hiding, fighting and waiting to be found behind locked doors and homes that were never their own. There are girls being shot with their mind as the target. He tells her that delicate is in her DNA, and mood swings will always determine who gets the pay raise. So stick to your soap opera's little girl, keep swallowing that pill for dessert, or have you already washed away the taste of sanity? Watch where you walk, step over the hopscotch, with life turning into a game of tag. Be careful not to get lost in this traffic. Mutilation may not be a safety precaution practiced here, my dear, but baby, stay safe. Always travel to the bathroom in pairs. Keep your people close and be sure to stay quiet if your husband is drunk at home. Welcome to the red, white, and blue. We stand proud in the top 10 most dangerous places for women. So take your ration of words now as he tells you that he does not know how long it will take to lay leveled in the stars. Because time will always float by in the shape of an hourglass as they mold our bodies but little girl, remember that they will never get inside of your mind. So walk with us, hand in hand, sending voices overseas, a group of eccentric, we are women. Conquerors made, and in the making, faces of freckles and untouched eyebrows, hips and lips with opinions, there is joy in our feet. So little girl, come, learn to tap dance on the stars, because we will land above their clouds. We will finally reach the sun, and together we will grow and thrive. So little boys make way, it is her time to rise. Hi, I'm William Fuller, and you can find my piece on page 26 called an interpretation of Article 1. The Constitution states that Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion. When considering the extent that the Founding Fathers meant when they said no law respecting the establishment of religion, I believe that this is to say that the government should not partake in supporting any religion. As a result, they should not pass any laws with religious meeting or any law that utilizes a holy book as its main reasoning for existence. This understanding of separation of church and state should not just be put into place overlooking our laws, but as a rule for all areas of government. No monument should be put up on government property that signifies religion. Some instances for this to be taken into account should be the Mount Soldad Cross, the words under God from our Pledge of Allegiance, the Ten Commandments on many courts that are supposed to be secular. All of these things should be removed from all public land and traditions to ensure the U.S. government is not supporting any one religion. All memorials for fallen soldiers of any war that consist of any religious symbol should be removed because it is disrespectful for all of the fallen who are not part of that one religion. When one religion is represented for the fallen, for the fallen of the war, in the case of the Mount Soldat Cross or Vietnam War Memorial, it is disrespectful for all of the Jewish Muslim and atheist soldiers who lost their lives in the war, especially in the case of the Mount Soldad Cross, which has anti-Semitic origins. It is extremely disrespectful for any Jewish soldiers who lost their lives in war. America is not a Christian country, and putting a Christian cross on public property is offensive to all who, have, who do not uh, practice the faith. Next is the Ten Commandments. Outside many courts in the Bible Belt portion of the South is a large erect monument of the Ten Commandments. This is directly disobeying the laws of the courts, which are meant to be secular in nature, to judge people based on their actions in the world and the laws of America, not the laws of Christianity. This also involves having a president being sworn in on the Bible and having a witness to, uh, swore it, eh, sworn in under oath. 
Religion should hold no place in the courts. The only books considered in the process of law should be those written for American law, not those written with a holy purpose. To truly remove religion from our government, we must remove the words under God from our Pledge of Allegiance. To have every child in America say that the, say the Pledge of Allegiance under God is a serious violation of freedom. To a large part of the population, the idea of there being a God is offensive. To a smaller but no less important part of the population, the idea of there being only one God is offensive. Any religious reference being a part of a main way children show patriotism to this great nation instills the idea in the future generations that to be patriotic, you must be religious. This is a dangerous path of ideology that if continued to lead America down the path of a much more religious country, like Iran or Afghanistan, where minority populations of different religions are persecuted for their beliefs, like the Christians did during the Dark Ages. Thomas Jefferson said, millions of innocent men, women, and children, since the introduction of Christianity, have been burned, tortured, and fined, and imprisoned. Yet we have not advanced one inch towards uniformity. What has been the effect of this coercion? To make one half the world fools and the other half hypocrites. To support roguery all over, an uh, error all over the earth. I think this encapsulates the ideas of separation of church and state, and shows that the Founding Fathers really did mean to separate religion entirely from government. It would be offensive to the Founding Fathers to see what has happened to that much needed wall between church and state that they first erected in Article 1 of the Constitution. 101 million Americans aren't Christian. 101 million Americans see their government supporting a religion that is not their own. We as the 101 million ask America to stop. Stop letting children say, under God. Stop letting our president be sworn in on the Bible. Stop having twit witness testify, under God. Remove the God words, in God we trust, from our currency. Stop putting up monuments that represent uh, Christianity in America. America is supposed to be the leader of the free world, not the leader of the Christian world. We'd be a lunch in one million, want legislation enforcing religious freedom, and a Supreme Court justice who support religious freedom, and school board members who support free-thinking Americans. It's time to show the world we support all peoples of the world, and not just the Christian population.
We have taken to the streets. We have screamed our throats raw. And it is time to remind Congress that they are adults and they work for the American people who demand a working government, not a pouting one. We will not accept them taking their positions for granted. We have expectations. We are teenagers who demand a stable government and a peaceful country. We are teenagers. We are the future. We are Americans who demand that American voices don't get lost in the wind anymore. We demand that action be taken. No more should die. No more should be traumatized. No more should feel hopeless. We are teenagers. We grew up in a nation that will become the leader of the free world. We grew up in a nation that will become the greatest nation in the world. We grew up in a nation that will become the most free nation in the world. We grew up in a nation that we will build again. Without the racism, without the sexism, we will build a nation with tolerance and acceptance for all. has occurred in America. Immigrants are still in detention centers for the crime of crossing our border. They do not know where their families are. Children are still imprisoned in abandoned department stores, away from their parents, and being told not to cry, not to sit on the floor, not to hug their parents, I mean hug their siblings. They are waiting, endlessly waiting, for a chaotic administration to find their parents. They're waiting to see whether they will escape a terrible situation and live in America, a country they risked so much to get to, a country whose immigration laws are mostly based on circumstance. And it can take a decade or more to become a citizen. If you are trying to get into America to find the money to save your family, you cannot wait a decade or more. Immigrants travel to our border, reached the asylum stations, and were turned away and told that there was no room. In a final act of desperation, they traveled across the Rio Grande, were caught, and had their babies taken from their arms. Some parents said that they were told that their children were being taken away for baths, but they never saw them again. Is this really something that my country's done? The land of the free unless you're an illegal immigrant. Then, your rights are non-existent. Then, you're taken into a building where the lights are always on, or a building where you're woken up at the crack of dawn to scrub toilets. And you're fed only soup, full of water from the hose, so everyone can eat. Or frozen sandwiches and vile water that you can hardly choke down. And I've heard that some children only have beds when the authorities come to visit. When the authorities sleep, they sleep on the concrete floor. This is cruel, intolerable, and despicable. We need to work harder to bring these families back together. The administration does not have a clear system. They have missed the deadline to bring all children five and under back to their parents. They have failed these children. And even when the families are together, they will still be prisoners. Their prison conditions worse than that of a murderer. We cannot simply move on from this. Immigrants are in terrible conditions. Immigrants have no constitutional right to a lawyer. Immigrants are being treated like they're less than human. But will we lay down and watch? Can we, as Americans, watch suffering and look away? We will not look away. We need to protest, raise funds, and raise our voices high until this eternal nightmare is dealt with, and not by saying, all right, we'll throw them in jail together. Immigrants are humans, and I will not rest until they're treated as such. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa, and I decided to write a poem concerning sexual assault. 
difficult among children because it's a very current and very overlooked thing. It's one of the most un underrated crimes in the world, not just in America. And if you're a female under the age of 18, there's a one in nine chance you will be sexually assaulted at least once in your life. Hands. White knuckled, boy clutching hands. Band aided, lost mommy, mud covered hands. Hands, rough and dirty, skimming body, two tough hands. Newly bloody, freshly damaged, terrified, shaking hands. Hands that will not hold the same, or look the same, or feel the same anymore. Hands with a story. Hands with a memory. Hands in a place they shouldn't be. Hands with red knuckles, no keys, no mommy, no daddy, no mud, no Hello Kitty band-aids. Feet moving, heart beating. Hands are a home no more. my school and filled our homes with tear gas. I didn't think I was going to make it out alive. My mother said she had an idea. America, she said, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I thought this sounds good. I could be safe. If only I could remind the young child I once was that I was very, very wrong. It took us months to get out of the country. My sister's school was destroyed. Finally, we had enough money for the trip there, but I guess the trip back was free. The first few months were tough learning to speak the language. I thought, perhaps in the end, it will be okay, but I didn't know how near it was. I got to go to school without fear in my mind, but as I heard the shot, I knew I was gone. Everyone scrambled to sit. I was confused on what was happening. One girl grabbed, my, grabbed me down and told me to shut my mouth. I heard doors banging, children screaming. I figured they, they were here for me, but they were here for all of us. The shadowed figure came into our room and just pointed the gun to me. I heard the words get down, pull the trigger. My name is Andrew, and I wrote a letter to Governor Cuomo regarding Pilgrim pipelines. Your job as governor is, dear Governor Cuomo, your job as governor is to take our needs and turn them into actions. The proposal to build parallel pipelines running along the Hudson River delivering crude oil, crude hydrofracked gas north is absurd and requires immediate opposition. The Pilgrim Pipelines proposal goes against what you believe in as a governor, and I hope that you will take the time to listen to what I have to say. If you are willing to learn from our country's mistakes, then you will find that 9, millions gal not 9 million gallons of oil have leaked from crude oil pipelines since the year 2010. Even with new pipeline infrastructure, the problem is not decreasing. Since the year 2009, frequency of oil spills have skyrocketed 60%. In New York, there have been 29 deaths and 100 injuries caused by pipelines. And that's just in New York. Why allow a pipeline to be built that has a high risk of causing damage when the area in New York being most affected will barely benefit from it? The proposed pipeline will cross two major aqueducts that provide tap water to New York City. Of many things that make New York City special, its access to clean tap water is one of them, and this pipeline has the potential to contaminate that water. When we know that crude oil contains thousands of harmful chemicals and newer pipelines have an increased chance of pipeline spillage, then why even consider accepting the Pilgrim Pipeline proposal? As a governor, you believe strongly in renewable energy and have taken a firm stand against fracking. Yet by supporting the Pilgrim Pipelines, you would be supporting the fracking industry. Need I remind you that the pipeline isn't carrying solar energy, but natural gases and hydroflacked oil? How can you not be immediately opposed to the idea of building these pipelines? If the fact that these pipelines are hazards to safety and they go against what you believe in as governor isn't enough to persuade you that building these are wrong, then you should consider the envi environmental damage that these pipelines do. Pilgrim Pipelines LLC proposed to run their pipelines along the Hudson River. 
If they spill, the crude oil will pour out into the beloved Hudson and kill or injure many of the animals that live in the Hudson. Even on the off chance that the oil does not go in the river, it would injure your land creatures just by physical contact. Now, let's say the pipeline does not leak. Then there would be no more view of the Hudson that so many people desire. Instead of getting a view of the Hudson, we would be getting a view of the Hudson and the pipeline. There are many harmful chemicals released if the pipeline doesn't leak. This is an issue that needs to be avoided. I thank you for reading this and listening to my opinion. It means a lot to me. I want to remind you that your job is important and your decisions matter. What do you go through said, this land is your land and this land is my land. I want to emphasize the importance of this land to many citizens of New York, including myself. I live in New Paltz and my home is near this throughway, where trees may have to be cut down to build this pipeline, impacting my local environment. I don't want my community to be exposed to fumes of crude oil containing harm numerous harmful chemicals. I hope that my opinion will be regarding when you're deciding whether you're going to choose to build this pipeline and disturb the beauty of the Hudson Valley region. Hi, my name is Savannah. 
Um, my piece is a small poem about the recent videos coming out of white people calling the police on black people for simply living their lives. It's called Hashtag Looking All Black. Sure. Grilling at the lake. Selling water on a hot day. Swimming at the neighborhood pool. Sitting in a Starbucks. Napping in a college store. Mowing your lawn. Playing golf. Shopping at CVS. Playing a pickup game of basketball. I used to believe that the world would protect me. I now realize that the world resents me. I used to believe that racism ceased to exist. I now realize that it's here to stay. Hi, my name is Una, and the context for my piece is the hashtag if I die in a school shooting. If I die in a school shooting, I will never get to learn how to drive. If I die in a school shooting, I will never get to go through the stress and excitement of appalling for colleges. If I die in a school shooting, I will never get to achieve my dream of publishing a novel. If I die in a school shooting, I will never get to experience the feeling of falling in love. If I die in a school shooting, I will never get to experience the pain of heartbreak. If I die in a school shooting, I will never get to become a mother or a grandmother. If I die in a school shooting, my friends will never get homemade chocolate chip cookies for their birthdays again. If I die in a school shooting, my mother and father will have outlived their only child. If I die in a school shooting, my granny will never get another letter from me. If I die in a school shooting, my mother and father will be left with messy rooms and unfinished projects. If I die in a school shooting, I don't want a funeral where people dress in black and give their condolences to my family and friends. If I die in a school shooting, I don't want to be one of the faces that's plastered on the news for a few weeks and then forgotten. If I die in a school shooting, I don't want thoughts and prayers. I want change and action. If I die in a school shooting, I want people to tell my story and use it to advocate for gun control. If I die in a school shooting, I want a protest. I want a march. I want a bill. A law. If I die in a school shooting, I hope that the leaders of my country stop taking the influencing money of the NRA and start stopping the deaths of innocent kids and teenagers to guns. If I die in a school shooting, I hope that my death achieves something, that I don't become another body killed by a gun. If I die in a school shooting, I hope that none of the people I care for die as well. I hope I'm the only one. If I die in a school shooting, I hope that maybe just maybe I could be the last one. I am very honored to read a piece on page nine by Cielo called A Right for Humans, Not Females. Since the beginning of time, women have been looked down upon and seen as inferior. Though we don't realize it, gender discrimination has always been a problem. We focus on our president's needs and the next decision he has made. This news is substantial, but when are we going to start focusing on the important things? Children are being taken away from their families, and what are we doing? We don't want to listen because once we hear, we can't unhear. We are so convinced that we are incapable and that we can't do anything to help improve our country's situation. There is power in numbers, and if we all fight to end the problems of the world, we will reform to make change for the better. Still, in many areas, women's rights are limited. Recently, in Saudi Arabia, women were just granted the right to drive. Here in the United States, we drive everywhere. To us, it seems as though it's a simple right, and it is. Transportation is everything. It is, a, it is an essential part of everyday life. In climates like Saudi Arabia, being able to drive is a privilege that women have just earned. But why must we earn what is given to men so easily? Though I mentioned that women have been looked down upon since the beginning of time, it isn't completely accurate. Women used to be praised by ancient tribes, 
They say they saw women for what they actually are. We are more than just the makeup that sits on our faces, and we are beautiful even when you might not think we are. In most professions, women make less than the average man does. But what is average? We've created this idea of normal or the ideal, yet we don't even have anything to base it off of. All human beings are different. There are no two people that are all the same. Even though this is a cliche that is very commonly used, it is accurate. Why consider anything average or normal? Because there is no normal. It is simply idea, an idea that we've gotten used to. So, to word this better, the average amount of money a male makes per week is $1,019. And the average amount of money a woman makes is $859. Keep in mind that the age group I'm basing it off, this off of are 35-year-olds to 44-year-olds. Even so, the difference is a full $160. When adding that up over a month, it becomes a $640 difference. When adding that up over a year, it becomes a huge difference. But why? Why are men paid more for doing the same thing? We are both human, and scientifically speaking, we are both capable of the same work. When narrowing it down to the real reason, you find that it's because of men's egos. This may sound very directed, almost as if I'm pointing a finger at men. It depends on the man you're talking to. Some think that women are less, and some, like the ancient tribes, praise women for all that they've done for us. No matter which way you look at it, gender discrimination is wrong, and we need to change our ways of thinking. We have created this stereotype, this label, as girls being less and worse than men, and sometimes we live up to this standard. A woman that has been told such things are likely to believe it, and they may even convince themselves of it. Research proves that most times, men overestimate their abilities and are likely to do worse than they thought they thought they would. Women are the complete opposite. They tend to think little of themselves, and they tend to actually do better than their estimate. Most times, men dominate conversation, so when a woman has an idea, they're less likely to belt it out. We need to teach our future generations to stand on that stage and preach their opinions. Overall, I can conclude that equality is important, and we need more of it in our word-torn country. Whether it be equality of race or gender, we need to stick together to, to fight our way through this life. We are one, and we are whole. Some might even call us united if we weren't so focused on appearances. I strongly believe in gender equality, and I think you should too. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Hannah. My piece can be found on page 17, and I wrote a poem about different times in our country's history when we have taken away um, different groups we talk right about. And I talk about um, Native Americans, slavery, Japanese internment camps, and most recently the Muslim ban. We keep hurting others from different times and places and completely different races. As we do this, we violate the 14th Amendment instead of letting it be. The colonists came on the shore, and contrary from common lore, they weren't first. So they forced the natives west so that they could have the best, took property without the law, which still looks really raw. This goes on for a long time till there are a few natives left to tell the rhyme. Get people in chains, forced them from the golden plains, depriving them of liberty. Took about a hundred years and many innocent tears to let these people free, yet we still don't always see. We were afraid with every fiber after Pearl Harbor that they weren't on our side because of their race, so we wouldn't let them live in their own place. We forced them from their homes, young and those with weary bones, made them live in internment camps, depriving them of liberty. 
even though some of their very own sons were fighting with us and we shouldn't have made all that horrible fuss. In the present again we're scared, so people get all fired up and reared to not let others in because of their religion. So they ban them all, making dreams and spirits fall. Again and again, we violate people's rights. We don't listen. We say sorry some of the time, but when push comes to shove, we don't turn to love. But when push comes to shove, we must turn to love.
The trees and leafy limbs reach up to the sky, shaking in the wind, begging to be lifted away, to be taken from here, to be spared the suffering. But no help arises. No one hears its cries for help, its screams of terror. The limbs, once proud, reach into the sky. They drop to its side, resigned to the fate levied against them. Axes whirl in vicious circles, chopping through its engine core. Still no help arrives, for its pleas have fallen on an audience that long ago turned its back. The final blow lands, the great tree falls, falls into a pile of the dead, into its fallen brothers and sisters, ripped from their homes, strips of the, stripped of their roots, their limbs, their lives. One tree in a thousand, and they're all gone. Thank you all so much for doing such amazing things. Okay, so now I asked you a question before. What was one of the highlights of your week? And you have an answer in your head. So let's start with this row. Everyone stand up. Turn. Face your honored guests. <laughs> and we'll pass the microphone down, okay? Uh, the most... I guess um, interesting and inspiring part of the week was when we had both of our speakers come in. Um, I found that really inspiring. Uh, I think the most interesting part of the week for me was when we watched a TED talk about um, how people can be leaders, but you need to have followers too, and about how the movement is more than just the person who starts the movement. I thought that was really interesting. I think I was really inspired by everybody's different input and opinion on what inspired them and what they hold strong in their beliefs and that. I think it was really interesting to learn new right and easy to hear what everybody else thought about issues. I really liked our um, civic writing um, study block and I also really enjoyed our speakers. I think they really inspired me to say, especially about um, political um, action on a local level. Like Adele said, I really liked learning about civic writing. Um, I also liked when we did speed dating, where we talked about um, issues in the world. I was really inspired by Laura Garcia, one of our speakers, that came in and talked about her stories of immigration. I mean, not immigration, but being an undocumented immigrant in this country. Um, to me, the most inspiring part of this week was actually today when we went to the library to look at the um, scenes, I believe. Uh, hearing Dan Torres talk about uh, running political campaigns. Um, I have two answers, a serious one and a fun one. Uh, <laughs> the serious answer is uh, when Dan Torres came out and uh, showed us that you can be any age and still get into activism. The fun one was on the first day we uh, Make paper airplanes because we want to have fun, and um, someone will um, <laughs> start destroying them. And uh, so last night, or just before we left, I was like, okay, if everyone makes 10 planes tonight, we we'll, can't destroy them all. Um, so I made 10 planes. I came in this morning, and um, Trey had dumped a bag of like 30 planes on the table. <laughs> so that was, that was, that was good. <laughs> I have three favorite moments. Okay, but I'll try to be brief. I'll try. So, I'd have to say that my top favorite moment is when we learned about immigration and Laura came in, and we and we also saw how it really worked in this country. It was part of what inspired a lot of what was in my essay. Also, I liked the contrasting opinions about social media study. That was fun too. And of course, the planes. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite moments during this week was listening to the speakers and like the many things that they had to say. They were all really inspiring and just like meeting all of these people who all are just advocating for social justice and just making a lot of new friends, which was really great. Um, my favorite part of this week was probably when we got to draw on the ground talk. <laughs> I felt five again. It was a nice feeling. <laughs> I really liked when we got a chance to read a poem submitted to the UN and, you know, listened, spoken, and was read to them 
by an islander in Europe. She from the the Marshall Islands. In the Marshall Islands, where it was a poem written from the perspective of a letter to her newborn child um, concerning the issues of global warming. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite moment of the week probably has to be on the first day we did this thing called speed dating, and we were stood in a line, and every like two minutes we'd swap, and for every person we got to conversate about like a certain issue concerning our country today, and I thought it really helped me open up to everybody and meet some new people, and I really like the planes too. That's <laughs> the <one. laughs> So um, my favorite moment was just kind of, on the first day, it was kind of like shocked me how passionate um, our young writers were. I was like, wow, um, these kids are really going to do great things with their lives. I, when I was their age, I was not half as passionate. I'm just so proud of the work that they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, this was a major highlight, watching them behind the podium. And also just in observing them, um, seeing the conversations that they had, the, a lot of these kids you know, met on Monday and they're leaving here with a community and hopefully um, a, a feeling that they're supported and there's other teenagers that are like-minded and, and care about things and they're not the only ones. And Lindsay. Yeah, um, my favorite um, part of the week was the first day during speed dating. Um, I was kind of floating around listening to different conversations and it just really made me realize that activism doesn't have an age and how knowledgeable and open you all are with coming here and just being, creating this community that we did just in one week. So, I think you can. <laughs> and I'll just say that um, some people might have seen a photograph uh, that I took of uh, someone who's one of your ages. Um, I was in, in Parkland, Florida, and I was at a demonstration on, on gun violence um, in, in, I think it was in February, and maybe you saw the photograph because there was a, a, a press release that we wrote about this program, and there's this young woman standing about two feet off the ground amongst lots of people, and she was talking with a megaphone, and I, and I think partly my highlight is today hearing your, you with a microphone sharing your ideas about what you believe and what you want, and using and, and, and all different kinds of things that we need you to want, and we need you to guide us on. And so for me, this is just a very um, satisfying moment, and I guess in, in, in the Tom Meyer, that's me, term, I'd say I double dare you to to keep the microphone and to keep learning about the things that you care about and, and share what you care about with other people because that's, I think that's part of what a democracy is about, the many voices and the many issues and your participation in, in voicing what concerns you. So thank you, this is the very first effort, so again, thank you to everybody, in particular the writers and the teachers who um, brought today to us. Thank you.